trickle in and then um, I and Amanda, or Amanda and I, will start introducing ourselves, welcoming you properly and um, open up the event. So we'll wait for a few seconds to let everyone settle. Well, counting, counting in all our, the whole audience at the moment. I think we should, we should start. To begin with, um, I'll, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Dr. Andrea Elner. I am a lecturer in the Defence Studies Department. Amanda will introduce both of us more formally in, in a minute, but then at least you know who's speaking to you at the moment. Welcome to our roundtable. Before I start, I've been asked to make sure that everyone understands that this is, this is being recorded, this session, at the event, and it is being live streamed at the same time. We are also encouraging everyone to, um, to, to engage in discussions on Twitter with the handle Women, Peace and Security. And if when we're, we're getting to the questions session, please ask your questions in the Q&A box. Amanda and I will monitor the questions as they're coming in. You don't need to wait until all the speakers have finished because it will just make it more efficient because we can then start um, engaging with the questions. How we're going to run the session, I will explain, or Amanda and I will explain um, in a few minutes. So let's start. Formally now, hello and welcome everyone to the School of Security Studies, King's College London sponsored roundtable on women, peace and security, reflecting upon how we achieved the initial resolution 1325 and subsequent resolutions that make up the WPS agenda, the current challenges and sticky points we are facing and where we need to go to achieve the initial radical and emancipatory potential the first resolution promised. UN Resolution 1325 was unanimously passed by the UN Security Council on 31st of October 2000. The resolution recognized that violence against women in conflict and post-conflict was not an unfortunate, but somehow natural part of war, but a war crime. It is rooted in a long tradition of feminist thinking and activism that sees such violence as part of a continuum and whose approaches to and practices practices of conflict resolution, peace and security, put the pursuit of social justice and the abolition of structural violence at their heart. What more can we do to facilitate in practice and at every level of global politics, the pursuit of the possible futures this agenda could engender? Over to Amanda. Mm -hmm. We're very excited to bring together a group of esteemed colleagues, each providing important insights and entry points into understanding the evolution of the WPS agenda over these past two decades and explore where we might go from here. We're very grateful for our panelists' time and for sharing their thoughts, experiences, and expertise with us. And we're also very grateful for you for tuning in. Uh, let me briefly introduce myself as the co-chair of this roundtable. Like Andrea mentioned, I'm Amanda Chisholm. I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Security Studies here at KCL, and I teach and research on gender and global security, feminist IR, and feminist global political economy. My research focuses on global labor forces that support private military and security companies, and I'm particularly interested in how the privatization of warfare impacts the WPS agenda. Uh, again, I'm joined here by um, Dr. Andrea Elner, and like she said, she's a lecturer in the Department of Defense Studies, and she teaches on the, the WPS agenda and global security and on gender, armed forces, and war. Her research focuses on women in Germany during the Second World War and under occupation, the integration of women in the armed forces, as well as civil military relations and ethics, particularly moral injury. Together, we are joined by six panelists. Our first speaker is Dr. Sumita Basu. Dr. Basu is an assistant professor of international relations at the South Asian University, New Delhi. Dr. Basu has written and researched extensively on WPS and has made important post-colonial and decolonial interventions. Her most recent publication is a co-edited volume, New Directions in Women, Peace and Security, 
uh, published by, by Bristol University Press this year with Paul Kirby and Laura Shepherd. Our next speaker is Dr. Jamie Hagen. Dr. Hagen is a lecturer in international relations at Queen's University Belfast, where she is the co-director co of the Center for Gender in Politics. Her work at the intersection of gender security studies and queer theory appears in a number of peer reviewed journals, including International Affairs and Critical Studies and Security. Next, we have Dr. Swarna Rajagopalan. Dr. Rajagopalan is trained as a political scientist and has had an academic and political interest in questions relating to gender and security. She continues to write academically and in the general media on WPS topics. Swarna is a founding member of the Women's Regional Network, a women's peace network in South Asia, and the founder of the Prajna Trust, a nonprofit working on gender equality and peace education. Great, IT. Oh, Here I am. <laughs> sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> Dr. Raja Gopalan is followed by Cynthia Petri. Cynthia is an international expert in support to societies in transition with 20 years experience in the field in Western Central Africa, the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Her company, Beyond Peace, specializes in providing training and advisory services to armed forces on international norms, in supporting peace processes through women's participation, and in monitoring human rights violations. A member of the UK Stabilization Union, she regularly works with the EU, the UN, the OSCE, and the Sanremo IIHL, and in academia. Next, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Aiko Holvikivi. Dr. Holvikivi is a research officer at the LSE Women, or Center for Women, Peace and Security, and a guest lecturer at the LSE Department of Gender Studies. Her research covers different thematic areas of the WPS agenda, including gender training, peacekeeping, and forced displacement. Her recent articles appear in European Journal of International Security and the European Journal of Politics and Gender. Before returning to academia, Aiko worked in the field of gender insecurity with civil society and intergovernmental organizations, and her work continues to combine research with policy engagement and stakeholder outreach. Finally, I'd like to introduce Professor Saskia Stachewicz. Professor Stachewicz is a professor of international politics at the University of Vienna and the scientific director of the Austrian Institute of International Affairs, OIIP. She was an affiliate uh, scholar at the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, and a visiting scholar at the School of Sociology, Politics and International Studies at the University of Bristol. Her research interests are in critical security and military studies, feminist and post-colonial theory and international relations, privatization of security, gender in the military, EU border security, transnational actors, including Frontex, and parliamentarianism, anti-Semitism, and the politics, uh, political history of Austrian Jews. This round table is divided into two parts where we've asked each of our panelists to consider specific questions and provocations. The first part is themed around how did we get here and asks each person to reflect upon the history of the rise of the agenda and the activism that underpinned the resolutions. The second part is themed around current challenges, but also thinking about the potential futures of the agenda. We've asked the panelists to consider the current state of affairs but also what interventions we may need to do in order to realize the initial promises of WPS and Resolution 1325. Each part is 45 minutes with 15 minutes of Q&A from you, the audience. As Andrea mentioned, um, you can trickle in questions through the Q&A um, chat box you'll find at, at the bottom of the screen as they, as they come to you. We hope um, while you're doing this, you can indicate which panel member you'd ask the question to and who you are. Um, that would help us out a great deal. Also, like this is being live streamed, so please join in the conversation on Twitter uh, with hashtag WPS and you can um, tag the School of Security Studies or any of us and hopefully we can, we can pick it up there. So um, we have agreed on a speaking order for the panelists. Um, so we'll um, move on to um, hearing them now. I want to thank you again for tuning in and I'm going to hand the floor over now to Samita. Thank you, Amanda and Andrea for organizing this panel discussion and a big hello to everyone joining us today. 
The first question, uh, as was mentioned, that's been identified for us is um, how we got here. And this question has a special meaning for me because my PhD thesis written a long time ago now, uh, focused on the passage of 1325 in the year 2000. So I take this opportunity to return to that point in the evolution of the WPS agenda. And well, so I'm glad that I'm speaking first in this session. Um, there's much that can be said. So I decided that my comments today would be centered on the institutional context of the UN Security Council, a theme that I've examined a fair bit in my research. We know that the provisions of Resolution 1325 and its nine sister resolutions are not particularly radical from a feminist perspective, but that these have got so much importance because the Security Council now says so for better and as some feminists would also argue for the worse. So how did the institutional ca uh, context matter in 2000? Uh, I will highlight three aspects of this. First, if we look at all the hard work uh, that went into the advocacy for the passage of the resolution, we find that even though uh, civil society actors were the driving force, and there's a consensus in the literature on this, they took seriously the protocol that marks formal council deliberations. Anecdotal evidence, as well as research publications by those involved, suggest that while the NGO working group worked feverishly behind the scenes, they made sure that they did not appear to be driving the agenda and that member states had the ownership of the draft resolution. This they did even as they maintained a public critique of the UN and member states in their press briefings and statements as at important junctures such as the Beijing plus five review meeting in June uh, 2000 and the WPS ARIA formula meeting in October 2000. Further, the WPS advocates systematically put together were rooted in the council's mandate. Uh, the advocates that I'm now talking about were also from UN, especially UNIFEM, and permanent representations of governments. My second point relates to the role of member states in the council. Needless to say, there are differences in their standpoint on gender and its relevance in the council's agenda. Certain countries are also hostile to the idea. Resolutions and uh, debates on WPS, uh, however, offer an opportunity for non-permanent member states to leave their mark on the council. Namibia, which held the presidency of the council in October 2000, when 1325 was adopted, was also driven by um, its recognition of the role played by women in the United Nations Transition Assistance Group uh, on its own soil in 1989-1990. Uh, and in later years, we find, for instance, that the US and France have focused on protection issues in keeping with their thematic interests in protection of civilians in armed conflicts and children and armed conflict, respectively. Finally, I return to the debate on the WPS agenda um, regarding the, the association uh, with the Council. Well, approximately five months before the passage of Resolution 1325, the Implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action. In the report, present a deeper assessment of issues relating to women and armed conflicts uh, than uh, Resolution 1325 does. For instance, a direct link is made between military expenditures and social and economic development related to women's lives. But how often is this report cited? Clearly, the resolution is regarded as the more important document by feminist scholars as well as member states directed against its setup and mode of functioning is still understood to be the most important international entity uh, as far as deliberations on international peace and security are concerned. Uh, that's it for me, thank you.
I've unmuted. Can we hear me now? <laughs> um, so it's fantastic to be here at this roundtable today. Um, Sumita was actually the chair on the first panel I ever presented work on women, peace and security. Uh, so it's it's fantastic to have the opportunity to be on a roundtable and contribute to this conversation, uh, thinking about, you know, uh, how did we get where we are with uh, the now 10 resolutions. So building on some of the thoughts about uh, really the role of this being rooted in civil society, um, the way I think about women, peace and security and where we are now is really thinking quite expansively, if not queerly, right? about uh, women's empowerment and a gender perspective in peace and security work. So yes, of course, we have 1325 in the year 2000, very pivotal, very important. You know, in my first week on gender, peace and security in our MA module, we read 1325 and we talk about the text in detail, right? But I also think that it's important to remember, of course, women's engagement in peace and security work did not begin with 1325. We have decades of work before that. and. There's a long legacy of um, this work that's really been unrecognized as being part of peace and security work um, now. Uh, just making sure that everyone can hear me. My audio was cutting out, um, but I think you can all hear me. So I think as I'm thinking through the roots of 1325 and uh, the Women, Peace and Security agenda, I think about this conversation I had with Charlotte Bunch in uh, 2012. I, I interviewed her, and you know, Charlotte Bunch, if you don't know, is a lesbian inter international uh, human rights organizer and activist, and was uh, part of has done really groundbreaking work at the UN. But uh, was part of the gender equality architecture reform gear, which then. Uh, led to UN women. And I think it, it is important for us all to remember that the UN infrastructure of all of this is relatively new. It's, it's all kind of, we're, we're in the messiness of all of it right now. But that said, um, there's, there is tons of, there's decades of work in, in, in unrecognized spaces of doing, of doing peacekeeping and peace building um, that, that this is built on, right? So that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the resolution, but I'm thinking about all that went into and got edited out of that work to then lead to uh, the 10 resolutions. But uh, one of the things that Charlotte said to me in the work that she does is that human rights are indivisible. And as someone who's motivated to think about um, a gender perspective that is, of course, inclusive of LGBTQ voices, um, that is something that's really grounding for me to think about human rights as queer rights and, and women's rights as human rights. I also find it super fascinating that um, the first president of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Jane Addams, uh, was a lesbian. And so we're talking about in 1915, one of the leading voices of the Women's Peace Party in the US is a lesbian. And um, I imagine a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> and I think that matters. I think that matters if that part of the story of women's, the women's peace movement is not something that people are terribly knowledgeable about. But moving into um, my, my final point here, a um, bunch in our interview also really emphasized the importance of every country taking a lead in the human rights struggle. And certainly this is just more broadly thinking about human rights organizing, but very much applies to the women, peace and security agenda. So when I learned about 1325, I learned about it through Peace Women and the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Um, I urge you to check out the work that they're doing if you're not familiar. And uh, the founder and CEO of uh, GNWP, Mavic Cabrera Beleza, was pivotal in really uh, helping me understand what it means to look at women, peace, and security at work. So in the work that GNWP does, it's part about, uh, part of that is about localization trainings and uh, helping uh, local and regional initiatives define women, peace, and security uh, in based on what human rights issues are most pressing and how how they understand them. So, um, you know, I think as Mavic explains, she trains women and girls in international laws on gender equality, women's rights, and peace and security work so that they can use these laws to assert their rights and demand their important role in decision making. So like this is sort of as I see it, Women, Peace and Security 1325 is really another tool in opening up space to allow for this, right? To, you know, the NGO working group 
uh, as was mentioned earlier, is about, you know, bringing these perspectives to the fore to hold states accountable for actually having a gender perspective in peace and security work, which was written into that resolution that, you know, gender perspective must be included. And um, I think today we're just seeing, you know, 20 years of work to continue to find new and um, powerful ways to continue to do that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this um, uh, panel. I'm so delighted to be here. I'm going to speak today from my location as an independent scholar, as a peace educator, a writer, and a citizen working towards gender equality and peace. Um, on October 31st, 2000, I was a postdoc at Michigan State, and I was sitting in my office dodging ladybugs that were falling from everywhere and playing a newly discovered um, toy, the UN web TV stream, which was crystal clear. And on the stream at that point with the speeches and security council uh, preceding the, the adoption of 1325. And I sat there and I listened to them and worked, not quite realizing what a historic moment it was. Um, and then I didn't think about it. There are so many UN resolutions, most of them, fairly empty from the point of view of the average person. I didn't think about this again till about 2011 when I was invited to a conference in 1325. So how did we get there? One part of the history of the resolution is of course recorded in the resolution. But um, you know, I work in this little corner of the universe and in a very small organization, writing things that very few people read talking to groups of 10, 15 on a lucky day. And 1325 symbolizes something very hopeful for me. The change does come. So the romantic, the miraculous part of 1325's coming into being for me is really the history of women's peace activism that others have mentioned as well, local and transnational, for over a hundred years prior to its passage. Weaving in a dozen other struggles, illustrating that peace is more than no war, women activists were also among those fighting for better labor conditions, the suffrage for nationality against colonial rule. They wrote letters, petitions, newsletters, traveled when they could, where they could, and internationalism was integral to their thinking as they supported efforts to stop war, to bring peace. They supported the formation of the League of Nations and then the United Nations. Most of you know this history better than I do. In the post-colonial era as well, even before the global women's conferences, women continued their efforts to network, raise common concerns, build solidarity. There were differences then and there are differences now. Sometimes they seem insurmountable, but that doesn't really stop us. Um, and I'm thinking particularly, for example, about the tribunals in the 70s around the um, question of comfort women, sexual violence and conflict. A huge amount of effort must have gone into putting them together. And surely some funder asked, well, did you have any impact? How are you going to measure impact? And it would have been impossible to answer this question then. But less than 20 years later, the tribunals on Yugoslavia and Rwanda clearly established rape and sexual violence in conflict as crimes against humanity. And within a decade of that, you have the passage of the adoption of 1325. We now agree, as if we always have, that sexual violence in conflict is an abomination and completely unacceptable. It's a very long journey in a very short time. And um, when you just think about how short 30, 40 years are in the human experience. And it seems to me to be near miraculous that we have walked in the years that I can remember as an adult from thinking that rape is one of the spoils of war for soldiers to agreeing now that it's completely accept, unacceptable. Each of the pillars of 1325 comes from a history of activism by women that illustrates both the fact that women do engage competently with issues of peace and security and that if you keep working on the big issues in your small way, change comes. It does add up. Cynicism is very, very cool. And um, 
people always ask, what is the point of what you are doing? How can you measure it? Uh, where will all this effort lead? What is the point of this campaign? What is the point of the UN, which is now 75 quite pointlessly? And I, I'd like to close this part of what I want to say by actually pointing to 1325. That is the point. Chipping away year after year, day after day, wherever you are, alone and together with others, you can make things change. And I think if that's the only purpose that this resolution ever served, it would be good enough for me. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those who are following us from Asia. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I will just add a few words after what we heard from the other panelists. Um, the adoption, as they outlined, of uh, 1325 is, is, is the result of the joint hard work over decades of civil society organizations, of the UN, and governments. And I believe there were two main factors that enabled its adoption. The first one, as I think was just explained by, by uh, Swarna, is that after the celebration of the Beijing uh, 95 conference, which was very successful, public opinion and women's groups discovered the shocking extent of the use of rape in conflicts that were well covered by the media. Uh, Bosnia and the genocide in Rwanda. So women's groups pressured the UN and governments to put an end to violence against women in war. But I think the second factor that enabled that is that in 2000, we were a few years only after the collapse of the Cold War era political systems, and they had not yet rearranged. There was room for consensus and for progressive policies. Would this have been possible today? Probably not, because today the political space has shrunk, the state is back with a revenge, and we can see a very confrontational political landscape full of shows of toxic masculinity, winner-takes-all approach, as we can see every day uh, in the media. So it was, I think, this international environment that helped women's group uh, promotes their, their agenda. So what's the significance of, of 1325? It is in the huge shift, it means at the conceptual, the social and the political levels. A shift from civil society organizations being in the background to civil society organizations taking the front stage. And a shift from women's roles and safety as a social issue to women's roles and safety as an international peace and security issue. So what we need today, in spite of the difficult political context uh, I just reminded, is to take this major shift to the next step. Because 1325 is definitely an achievement, but women are still the object of the policy. The next step is that women are not only the objects, but the designers and the implementers. And we will address this, this level and the path to, to that in the next session. Okay, hello everyone. I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to thank Amanda and Andrea for posing this first question because I think it's always important to think back on how it is that we got the WPS agenda and that's partially in service of a feminist ethics to acknowledge what Sumi Madhok calls our feminist debts. Um, but also partially to interrogate what we might have forgotten along the way and what lessons we can draw from what went before. Um, now, as all the previous speakers have rightly highlighted, the WPS agenda builds from at least a century of women's peace activism. And in this tradition, getting a Security Council resolution on women, peace and security was seen as, a, as one pragmatic step along the way not simply to getting women into existing structures of power, but to take meaningful steps towards transformative change and ultimately peace. Um, and now the agenda has arguably developed um, somewhat of a focus on security over peace, um, despite reminders from advocates such as Cora Weiss that its aim was never to make war safe for women, 
Um, and so I think it's worth revisiting some of the historical steps along the way. And the aspect that I'd like to draw attention to is the development of WPS in the context of broader initiatives towards gender equality within systems of global governance. Um, arguably, it was instruments such as CEDAW, so the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, as well as advocacy around women and later gender in development, um, in conjunction with the UN World Conferences on Women, that helped build the normative context in which a Security Council resolution on gender and conflict became thinkable. Um, so on the one hand, I think this raises questions of what we can learn from these fields. Um, for example, we've seen in the WPS context the development of initiatives um, such as my research area, Gender Training for Peacekeepers, um, as well as the use of instrumentalist arguments like the fact that gender perspective increases operational effectiveness. Um, but what we don't always remember is that gender training was de delivered to development practitioners already in the 1990s, so before we had a WPS agenda. Um, and that the incorporation of gender analyses and development work was often justified in similarly instrumental terms, such as investing in women is good for development. Um, and I bring these up to suggest that WPS scholars and practitioners might have something to gain from studying international development and what the history of this field might teach us about some of the opportunities opened up and the political dangers um, that adhere to some of the strategies we're using. Um, similarly, there's an argument to be made, um, such as one suggested by Madeleine Reese in a recent publication, that the WPS agenda could gain from fostering closer linkages to human rights frameworks such as CEDAW, and that's partially because these come typically with more established monitoring mechanisms than what we have um, with the WPS agenda but also because an attentiveness to human security, which includes economic security that these human rights frameworks give us could help ensure that the WPS agenda addresses the concerns of a diverse range of women. So when it comes to the question of how we got the agenda, I think it's important, important to bear in mind the traditions and goals of women's peace activism that it draws from, as well as to retain in our view how WPS fits in with a broader normative frameworks on gender equality. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Vienna. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers uh, who already mentioned so many interesting aspects of how we got uh, the resolutions. Uh, I would like to add just one more point to this, because there is this, this common narrative that foregrounds the relentless uh, lobbying and, and strategizing of women's organization in how um, women, peace and security got institutionalized at the level of the Security Council and beyond. And it's certainly a very important aspect, the work of women and women's struggles to take gendered insecurities uh, to the highest level security organization. But there's also another layer to the story, and um, Carol Harrington has written about it in her 2011 paper on post-Cold War feminism and the UN, uh, where she says uh, that it's also been geopolitical power relations that mattered a great deal at the end of the Cold War, and uh, that superpower politics and the rise of the US as the lone superpower uh, was an important context. Uh, particularly in how the US uh, began to uh, substantially argue its geopolitical claims in connections to democratization and women's human rights and the problematics around that sort of legitimization. Um, so I'm not bringing this up to diminish the work of feminists and, and women's NGOs, obviously not, and neither does Harrington. But I think it's an important reminder that the power constellations that uh, shape such agendas are meaningful and they're likely to have an impact a long way from um, you know, the, the establishment of the resolutions themselves. And there's, there's no real way out of this. We have the institutions we have and we op operate under the constraints that we do. Uh, but I think it's important to reflect on it uh, and to not engage you know, in, in unproductive conflict among uh, different feminist approaches to the agenda. 
And this is probably also leading a little bit into, into the, the issue of what's, what's up next, uh, is that I see two you know, main strands of critique around why a WPS has not achieved yet what it uh, was uh, designed to do. Uh, and simplistically said, I think there's, there's two ways of approaching this issue. And one was a more pragmatic, strategic approach that focuses on the formulation of national action plans, uh, evaluation, and uh, most often on implementation and the many uh, institutional technocratic challenges that hinder the realization of the agenda. And the other is a more critical uh, approach that scrutinizes the broader narratives and stereotypes underlying the agenda and uh, criticizing it uh, quite vocally um, about its you know, tendency towards essentialist, universalist, sometimes orientalist representations of women and their security needs, particularly around the issue of um, addressing women mainly as victims of violence and forgetting about uh, the very important uh, issues of participation and representation of women as, act as actors and active agents um, in their own interests. Uh, and like in many other feminist, inner feminist debates, I think we definitely need both approaches to keep pushing for change, uh, but also to hopefully engage more with each other. Because I think the, the institutional constraints and the underlying narratives and stereotypes very much feed off of each other. And um, there, I think there's, there's a lot to gain here from, from uh, connecting these two critical strands, especially around this, uh, much criticized focus on gender-based violence and, and forgetting you know, other more emancipatory uh, issues around WPS. And that's it for me in the first round. Great. Oh, my goodness. I'm in awe of the, the sharp analysis um, and reflections our, our panelists have done so far. Um, yeah, so we have a few questions here that I guess I'm just going to read them all out and then I'll get uh, the panelists to respond afterwards. We have um, four. One is specific for Samita um, from Cornelia Wise, and she just wants to obtain a copy of your dissertation. So um, Cornelia, we can get that done. I think um, Samita is going to email that out and we can, we can uh, distribute that, I'm sure. So um, yeah, that was an easy question. Uh, and then we've got another one from uh, I'm, uh, Gra Grazilla. Oh, it, it was answered, I guess, or it just moved away. Wait, Grazilla. Um, yeah, so the Department of Politics, Surrey University, and she says, hello, just a small comment and question. On the 28th of August, 2020, another resolution was adopted, Resolution 2538 on women in peacekeeping operations, thus making the total of WPS resolutions to 11. And then the question is, shall we celebrate or think that having one resolution after another is becoming a ritual with little accountability? So, um, so I'm going to delegate that to Swarna <laughs> to, to respond since she typed something in. So we'll let maybe Swarna weigh in on that one first. But before we move to the panelists, we also have two other questions that are posed. Uh, how can we increase awareness of historical women's activism um, in a fora beyond academia? And a following question, is, is there a risk that WPS, as interpreted by state actors, is constraining recognition of women's work? So um, I guess we can, we can decide who will answer those important questions. But right now, I'll just um, pass on to maybe Swarna to answer the first question, if that's okay. Sure. Do you want me to turn on the video? Yes, please. Yeah. Well, the answer that I wrote was that I would actually vote for it being, uh, for it becoming a ritual. Um, I think that there's something, there seems to be some sort of clock one. And this year we've actually had two resolutions, right? There was one in April as well. Um, this is in danger of becoming one of those typical UN uh, 
agendas where annually a resolution is passed, but nothing much comes of it. And in part, it comes from something I want to talk about a little later as well. But everything hinges on states adopting and implementing. So the question that I would append to calling this a ritual is, so what are we going to do about it? And um, I think that kind of relates to the second question that Amanda read out, which was about taking this up and doing some more. Is that my remembering that right? But I'll leave that for someone else to answer. That's uh, thank you, thank you, um, Swarna, for that. Sorry, I'm just working out the tech. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Um, great. So uh, Samita has um, volunteered to go up next to respond. So I'll give the floor to Samita now. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Raziella, for your comment. Um, since I'm so focused on the the politics of the council today, I just wanted to. Um, add a comment to your comment which is that if we that was adopted um it is not a women women and peace and security one uh, instead it is actually a resolution on peacekeeping operations um and i would just um uh you know i think that is an important distinction uh, when you do not name a resolution women and peace and security, but instead uh, a, a WPS re resolution is titled uh, as uh, under the theme of peacekeeping operations, what does that mean for the WPS agenda moving forward? Uh, it's too recent to, uh, to be able to come up with, and, I, and I'm not familiar with the politics behind the scenes for this particular resolution, uh, but I just wanted to highlight the title uh, uh, for our discussion. Thank you. I I also uh, uh, believe this is a very good question. So I also want to add a few words. Thank you, Graziella, because we all share your frustration at some points. Uh, I've shared this kind of frustration and I still do sometimes. So I, I totally understand this. But I have to say, these resolutions are not somewhere up there in the world of theory. They are useful because we can task governments to act about them. And I will take an example. Uh, in my work with my company, Beyond Peace, we do train uh, military uh, with compliance with international norms, meaning respecting IHL and the prevention of sexual violence. And if you show up in a military camp as a civilian woman and say, I want to tell you to stop raping women, um, you will not be as well received as if you come and say, your country has signed this UN Security Council resolution. And as military, your duty is to work for the political objectives of your government. And so I think that if it, it is, up to us to take these resolutions and make something with them. Go and see governments, go and see military, go and see diplomats and say, listen, this is what you've signed and this is how we're going to help you implement it. And, and I, I have used that a lot. And I think, you know, even if it's sometimes frustrating because we would like to have more, these resolutions are very useful because we can uh, task governments, uh, decision makers, armed forces to do things about them and to let us come in with our agenda and work for the improvement of women's rights, of women's recognitions, of women's roles at all stages. There's still a lot of work to do and we will take this in the second part, but I want to say I have found them very useful because for some uh, politicians, for some military, it is a language they can understand. Thank you. Hi everyone. I also hi Graziella. I also wanted to come in on your question, um, and and you might have been building towards this anyway. But I would I would argue that it's very both, right? And, and because that's the fantastic thing that feminist thinking and theorizing gives us is, is the ability to move from either or thinking to both and, um, and and perhaps adding to some of the reasons to celebrate. I mean, it kind of shows. It was an event recently um, 
where one of the one of the activists who was who was involved in the NGO working group getting resolution 1325 passed brought up that you know when that happened she didn't think that anybody in the Security Council thought that there would be another one that that was going to be kind of the end of it so the fact that it kind of keeps going demonstrates something of an institutionalization and, 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 and an establishment of the agenda and also I mean, it does in some ways demonstrate the, the kind of point that I was making earlier about perhaps the agenda focusing on security over peace and, and developing certain kinds of foci. But I think the passage of multiple resolutions also demonstrates that it's a field of ongoing contestation. Um, and this is something I thought was captured so wonderfully in Sunita and Paul Kirby and Laura Shepard's recent book about WPS as a community in a, in a field of ongoing contestation. So in some ways, these kinds of debates of, of which way the agenda is going and resolutions that, that focus on different aspects of it, in some ways demonstrate a, a maturity of the WPS field. Um, and I think there's definitely something to celebrate there. Thanks. Great, so we have a few more um, questions coming in. So I'm just going to read one from, um, from one of our panel panelists. Is the resolution linked to peacekeeping distracting from WPS or gender mainstreaming? So that's one question for our panelists to consider. And um, the, um, uh, and the second question, actually, from a, a, an anonymous audience member, which actually I um, I think probably can be addressed in the second part, but we'll flag it here. Um, the attendee writes, "Hello, all. Thank you so much for such a great webinar. Uh, I don't have any uh, one panelist member in mind. I understand that this resolution takes women, peace, and security as a societal issue to an international peace security issue, um, though it is a huge." huge step, but in particularly some countries uh, where laws to protect women from sexual abuse and violence and their rights are largely absent, how do you see this resolution going forward in creating space for women in such societies and states? Again, I think this is a great question and I'll flag it. Hopefully our panelists will be able to address that one in particular in the, the next um, part of this round table. Where do we go from here? Um, and then we have one question that just came in now from Victoria Scheer. Do you think the WPS agenda can finally change power structures in the Security Council? Thanks a lot. Um, so that question in particular, I wonder if I can actually pass that off to Samita. I'm sorry, I'm just flagging you up because I know you've written on this. So I wonder if you might want to respond to Victoria's question. I'm afraid the short answer is not so much uh, because um, uh, uh, we're working with a very uh, rigid institutional structure in the form of the um, the veto power and just uh, the, the 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 membership of the Security Council itself. And uh, charter changes haven't really happened in a long, long while. Um, so in that sense, no, but. At the time that the resolution was adopted and even some years after that, we saw uh, while that while the council had not changed formally, but informally there were processes that were suggesting a more democratic way of functioning. So from, uh, from the 90s onwards, we see the ARIA formula meetings which suggest a greater engagement with civil society actors. Uh, and these seem to be uh, uh, they seem to have become uh, quite a norm. We have civil society actors, including several prominent WPS advocates uh, speaking at Security Council open debates. Um, and um, uh, while, of course, the uh, permanent members uh, have a, a, a much greater uh, say in the deliberations of the council, and they have the kind of uh, institutional and historical memory that the non-permanent member states do not have, yet there was a, there is a greater appreciation of uh, um, the need to bring on board uh, non-permanent member states. And so we see a really interesting um, diplomatic negotiations. 
concerned that with recent developments, and I will go on to speak uh, in the second half, uh, there is a return to some of the older ways of working. So this is going to be a bit of a dated example. Uh, uh, when there was talk about having a, a, a resolution for peacekeeping operation in Ukraine, and Ukraine floated a pr proposal, and you usually work with that draft proposal, but Russia actually floated its own proposal as well. And that So uh, uh, I don't have a very optimistic take on that aspect right now. The second thing is, which I briefly looked at, it was uh, in relation to the WPS agenda is uh, the participation of women in council deliberations as uh, sort of female ambassadors of, of um, uh, uh, member states. And um, um, In, in a number of media publications that there was a personal acknowledgement of what gender means. Um, but uh, it's, it's not, it, ultimately national interest is the priority. Um, and, and so the power structures and, uh, and the national interests of the states play. Thank you. Great, thanks, Samita. Just um, real politic always <laughs> coming into play, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so we have a little bit of time before we take a bit of a break. Um, there was just one question. I just don't know if any of the panelists want to to answer um, while we wait for other questions to come in, um, and that is: Is the resolution's link to peacekeeping distracting from WPS um, um, or gender mainstreaming? Um, so uh, I guess we have Swarna that has volunteered to respond to that question, which is fab. So Swarna, I'll just um, pass it over to you. Yeah. Actually, this I, when I was listening to Shamita earlier, this question crossed my mind as well. I mean, the fact that you would have a resolution on gender and not flag it as WPS, is that a sign? that gender issues are finally being mainstreamed at the UN. Um, and I think this is something that we need to be conscious of. It, it's a broader question as well, isn't it? Do we want, how long do we want to have things flagged as gender for women or um, you know, WPS? And at what point do we want them to just become the way things are? So. It depends in some part on how well we think the WPS agenda is doing, if the resolutions are in fact, have in fact been effectively implemented, um, or um, whether this is just some way of um, forgetting that we even have that agenda. So I think that the choice that we make of whether it is the one or the other depends a little bit on um, our political reading of that moment as well as um, as well as how prepared we are for becoming redundant you know the wps is no longer a thing it's just normal so i leave it at that and let somebody else pick it up from there thank you swarna that's some really interesting and important reflections to have um, while um, other people are um, uh, pondering that, we have a specific question for Jamie from Tracy at the UK Defence Academy. And Tracy asks, to what extent are transgender women included as part of the WPS agenda? Great question. Um, and I think this brings us back to the question of what the Women, Peace and Security agenda is. And I think also reminds us that from what I see, women, peace and security agenda is very different in different places and it comes down to how people actually operationalize it. So if you look at the texts of the resolution, certainly transgender women aren't written in explicitly, but um, 
in the work I do and when I have conversations with practitioners one-on-one. -on -one, uh, so I came to, after doing my work with GNWP and Peace Women, I was disturbed to not see the word lesbian, lesbian, let alone transgender or bisexual appear in any of, for the most part, basically none of the reporting, I would say up to 2015 really, um, in thinking about the agendas. So when we're looking at indicators of implementation, a lot of times the gender is used rad, sort of with a default to heterosexual women. And so if someone had a background where they were queer inclusive and were thinking of trans women when they were implementing gender work as a gender advisor, implementing women, peace and security, then perhaps they are looking for transphobic violence. Perhaps they are look, looking to serve trans women, but was it explicitly written into programmatic work? Is it explicitly written into the resolutions at this moment? Uh, no. That, that doesn't mean that there can't be ways to be intentional and inclusive. And that doesn't mean that when people are doing what I would consider uh, women, peace and security work that may not be, you know, capital WPS work, that they aren't, you know, doing intersectional inclusive, um, trans inclusive, even trans led work. Um, and certainly, you know, I'm, I'm in Belfast and there's, you know, an organization trans and I when you have a gap in terms of what the state is able to provide in terms of basic everyday needs that uh, ultimately uh, are about your human security, your personal security, then the people, feminist and queer organizing um, may be very intentionally trans inclusive. So I think it, it depends on which level we think about. And I think it, uh, again, as I said, uh, when I was speaking earlier, uh, I think there's a real opportunity to think expansively and to continue to um, let the, the discourse be really broad about what gender means. And um, I, I appreciate you asking that question. And I think we need to be asking that question in every room where we're talking about a women, peace and security agenda. Is this queer and trans inclusive? If it is, what does that mean? If it isn't, why isn't it? Right. So um, I'll definitely be speaking about that more in our next panel. Thanks. So we've got some more um, really interesting questions coming in, but I think they're they're reflecting on uh, moving away from how we got here to more around the theme of where do we go from here. So I'm going to hold these two questions in particular, and I guess um, we we should transition into now that we're kind of evolving with our questions as well. Transition into the um, where do we go from here. So what we'll do now is we'll get the the panelists each to then. You you know, reflect upon um, um, that question. Uh, we're doing reverse order, so we're uh, starting with Saskia this time. And then after that, we'll return to the questions. But please, I do encourage you all throughout this is just to uh, keep popping questions in the Q&A and also through, through Twitter, hashtag WPS and um, tagging the School of Security Studies, and we will pick them up shortly. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to put Saskia on the spot and hand it over to her to to reflect upon where do we go from here. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I'm learning so much from this. Uh, I get to start on talking about where we need to go and that's a bit scary because there's so many directions obviously. Uh, I just want to pick up three things that uh, you know from my own positionality within the EU uh, seem to be important at this point in time. And the first one is really, we have a new EU action plan on uh, WPS that came out last year. I think this needs to be used um, to reignite the national implementation activities that in, in very many cases are really dormant uh, within the EU as well. Uh, and, and use this as a resource uh, to support those that are already fighting for these issues within their national institutions for a while. Um, and there are just a few things about the action plan that I think um, should be, you know, uh, put center stage really. And the one, the first one is the emphasis on knowledge and capacity building, really asking for institutional, cultural change, um, supporting the point that if before we even start thinking about implementing uh, WPS in any foreign policy or any external action, uh, we need to build the institutions that are actually capable of doing that. 
Um, and this, of course, needs to go uh, through training um, and a lot of measures that we already know, but they need to be thought of much in a much broader uh, way and really not only provide specific gender trainings, but really incorporate that knowledge into every training, every material, every measure on, in all the ministries and embassies that are um, charged with that. And I think this is really a point where the financial and personnel resources are lacking in many um, member states. The action plan in objective three uh, is also uh, foregrounding the integration of civil society. We know this already, this is very important, but how can we get to a really an institutionalized consultation process that is structured, that is regular, that is professional, that is building long-term relations uh, and networks among those that are affected by conflict, uh, activists, NGOs, academia, research, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, third point, uh, probably a little specific, but sexual and reproductive health and rights. I think uh, we need to remember that the UN Security Council is no or has not really been a very reliable partner in the struggle for these issues uh, for a while now. And there's this growing pressure on women's rights in this regard. And the EU should really be uh, filling this void um, and put all of these issues, conflict-related sexual violence, support for survivors, safe abortions, emergency contraception, uh, and all health-related rights of, of uh, pregnant women and mothers, um, put that on the front of the agenda. Uh, and also think about ways that men and boys can be included in these efforts to really have a change in gender norms. And uh, a final point within the action plan is the issue of refugees and migration. In the EU, that's usually handled under justice and home affairs, but of course that's a foreign and security policy issue as well. Uh, we know that gendered violence is a driver of migration, is perpetuated on migration routes, and it is um, also, you know, a problem in transit and in destination countries. Uh, we have the huge catastrophe in Maria right now. Why is there not, you know, more consideration for also from a, a WPS um, point of view and integrate that into border management, integrate that into all the, if we need to have border externalization, which I think we shouldn't have uh, from, from a human rights perspective, but if the EU is going down that road further, then uh, all agreements between the EU and third countries need to factor that in. Um, so these were my, my thoughts on the, on the action plan. Two more issues uh, that I would just like to briefly bring up. The one is, uh, I think WPS is still very state-centric, focused on state forces, international forces, which in the end are also state forces. So um, how can we think thoroughly about the link between global corporate actors and gendered violence? I'm thinking here about uh, also Amanda's work and my own on, on private military and security companies. These are uh, a huge factor in many global conflicts around the world. Uh, and they're also implicated in, in gendered violence. Um, we know all of this already, but how can we make uh, WPS more responsive to these issues? And then also beyond the issue of, of security providers, uh, there are so many, you know, uh, transnational corporations that are also a factor in um, in conflict around the world. I'm thinking, for example, of Colombia. My colleague Julia Saxeda has written about this, how transnational companies, through collaboration with armed actors, were involved in gender-based violence and in uh, displacement, particularly of Afro-descendant and indigenous women. So, um, what can we do about, you know, this part of the agenda that is you know, one step uh, away from, from the state-centric focus of it. And uh, last but not least, I think um, COVID right now, of course, is, is not only keeping us from celebrating WPS, it is also uh, putting new um, problematics and, and hindering uh, the realization of the agenda in many ways. Uh, it has a detrimental effect on gender equality in terms of labor divisions, rise of gender-based violence, of course, in post-conflict and conflict settings, this is uh, even more so. Uh, 
so think I think we should think about the ways we can not only fight exclusion from conflict resolution, but also from COVID resolution. How can uh, women be meaningfully integrated into everything we do about the pandemic, basically? And how can we understand global health security as a WPS issue um, and factor gender into the analysis of the crisis and how we can get you know, uh, women and women's networks and NGOs involved in the resolution. I have a few more things <laughs> to say about that, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that right now. And if there's any more questions, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that further. Thanks. Hello again. Um, I would basically like to endorse everything Saskia laid out in terms of where we should be going, but um, I'll start my, my remarks uh, reflecting on where we are at now and pick up and maybe build a little bit on the point about institutionalization. Um, I do find it remarkable the extent to which WPS is being institutionalized across a range of spaces from kind of dedicated NGOs uh, through to military institutions. Um, my own work focuses largely on peacekeeping, um, and that's an area where we can see the institutionalization of training programs, the establishment of reporting requirements on gender, and the creation of gender advisory positions in military institutions, and, and they often work closely with civil society and with academic experts in these endeavors. And, and while these are all laudable steps towards institutionalizing WPS, I think it's also worth interrogating what the effects of an increasing professionalization of this work are. So in this environment where civil society actors and security personnel build up a form of expertise on gender, there is always a risk that the figure of the woman in conflict, so the figure who activists worked hard to convince structures of power is a subject worthy of international protection and inclusion, for her to become something of an abstraction um, whose needs and interests are presumed to be already known. And this can be particularly limiting when we examine the extent to which gender expertise located in the global north is privileged in international for decision making. And, and here I'm very much also implicating my own work. Um, so I think it's crucial that WPS work maintains its connection to the plurality of women who are affected by conflict and that any interventions are designed with their diverse empirically established needs and priorities in mind. And in order to do that, going forward, I think we need to be constantly asking ourselves, who do we imagine to be doing WPS? And who do we think it's done to or for? So who gets consulted and who gets to have a voice in these initiatives? Um, and that asking these questions might also prompt us to critically re-examine our understandings of what counts as expertise and who is conflict affected and how. Um, and I think it's questions such as these that have generated work in activism and scholarship to, to revisit and to contest the boundaries of WPS, arguing uh, for many of the things that Saskia mentioned, right? So for the agenda to better address a continuum of violence, um, harms wrought by economic disempowerment or the inability to access reproductive rights, right? So to look at, look at kind of actual lived experiences of insecurity of women. And, and to think about that across perhaps what have been quite narrowly defined traditionally, you know, conflict or non-conflict contexts and conflict-related harm and non-conflict-related harm. So there's, there's some, some questioning that's happening around, around how those boundaries get drawn. Um, there's also work that argues uh, for, for the WPS agenda to better attend to questions of how the environment and climate change relate to conflict and gender um, and how women's knowledge can can also in this field um, has been has been marginalized again kind of at the at the hands of, of technocratic um, ex expertise situated in global global structures of power um, as, as well as work on, on where displaced women sit in relation to the agenda and in particular attending to the fact that displacement doesn't always stay within the conflict zone, right? So, so women can be conflict affected after they flee. And what does the and how does 
is the WPS agenda able to see that? And then what can we do to, to remedy if not? And, and again, in the contemporary moment, this attentiveness to security concerns beyond traditionally defined conflict is particularly pertinent, right? Um, in light of the current global pandemic, it's becoming increasingly um, untenable for the WPS agenda to, to not attend to a continuum of violence and insecurity, as well as for its failure to interrogate global racialized hierarchies um, that it's embedded in. But I'll probably end um, in terms of where we should be going. I think it's worth noting that while these interventions are often critical, they're not necessarily, if we, if we think of a distinction between critique and criticism, they're, they're a form of critical engagement because they point to significant investments in the agenda going forward. They point to the fact that, that we want more of it or we want it to do more things. Um, so, so I think there is still an investment in, around this community and the transformative potential in the agenda. And I will end there, thank you. Yes, um, I want to speak of three things. Um, forging an, an alliance, taking the driver's seat and defending women at the front line. Um, so many women in Yemen, in Cameroon, in the Philippines, in Lebanon, in Belarus are doing extraordinary things um, with a lot of courage and imagination, but they don't always receive the right exposure and support. How do we connect these energies and give them the right support and, and visibility? How do we create stronger networks? Uh, we all know, as we mentioned earlier in this conversation, that the stars are not aligned. We need to align the stars. That's, that's a job for us. And we need to find a new alliance, uh, like the one which permitted the adoption of 1325. Not a new organization, God forbid, but a new alliance between local and international, between governments, the UN, NGOs, and the private sector. So that's about forging an alliance. The second step is that while acknowledging the important role of civil society organizations, um, we have to keep imposing. It's not anymore advocating, promoting, imposing women's roles also at other decision-making levels um, and governance levels, not only as civil society, not only as carers, not only as victims. Women have shown leadership. In the COVID crisis, we have seen how women have, have shown uh, leadership and have managed uh, far better than other leaders uh, the control of the uh, uh, pandemic and the protection of the population. Women have shown courage from Sudan to Lebanon to Philippines to Cameroon women. They have shown a lot of courage. And I want to bring here the question about the global south. Uh, and we will, we will speak more in the, in the questions and answers. But a lot of women have, are showing incredible courage exactly in countries that don't have yet the right legal framework. Uh, they have shown effectiveness. There was this study run by Goldman Sachs uh, on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the voting rights for women in the US. And they found that all women or mixed gender US fund teams outperformed all male portfolio man management teams. So this, is, this shows that even in the financial sector, people start looking at effectiveness of women, not only in social issues, not only in political issues. And also another a a fifth quality that, that is shown these days is the ability to dialogue across the spectrum. I want to refer here to an, an initiative from the Cameroonian Women for a Ceasefire. In, in the Anglophone regions of Cameroon, there's a conflict for the past three to four years. And women in Cameroon uh, have launched actually two days ago this campaign, Lower Your Arms, uh, to ask for a ceasefire. Now, why do, do they paint their bodies? And this brings me to the third point, the uh, defending the women at the front lines. Why, why do they paint their bodies? 
first, because they don't want their bodies to be the battlefield. And second, because this allows them to remain anonymous, because all these women who are, who are asking for a ceasefire have received death threats. We need to put more effort to protect the women who are at the front lines, because they are the ones doing the job and they risk their lives. So what I want to say where we are now and where, where we go from now is a new alliance. We have to align the stars and uh, we have to acknowledge women's uh, courage, effectiveness, creativity, imagination, uh, uh, ability to, to dialogue across the spectrum, leadership and position them in leadership roles. And the third one, I think we have to defend women at the front lines because without them all our work will be only theoretical and academic which is very interesting but is not enough we have to be out there where real life happens and where women are fighting for all of us um. My remarks in this round are going to be a little bit um, awkward and hard to package cogently. So just bear with me because the, that is for a reason. Now, for the last 10 years that I've been paying attention to 1325, I've, I've done some academic work. I've done some work as a consultant. And I also talk about 1325 in um, in sort of ordinary contexts where I give a talk or I do a workshop to people who are not necessarily experts or diplomats or generals. So in, in these three worlds that I walk in and out of, 1325 is a really awkward beast. And that's one of the two things I want to talk about in this section. And I also want to say a little bit about the Global South question at the end. Um, you know, ironically, I, I was, I waxed eloquent about feminist activism leading to 1325, but 1325 then handed this agenda quite naturally as a UN resolution to member states. Now, why would member states deeply embedded invested in existing power structures actually set about changing them. So I think right away you start off with something that's a really bad fit and um, it's a hard expectation to have. Now I live in a state where the state in fact says that 1325 is not relevant because there are no conflicts in the state. So the usual route the prescribed route of lobbying for a national action plan has proven fruitless. How do you, what do you do with it? Now, as an academic, it's really easy because then I go on and I say, you know, it applies to traditional conflicts, although the resolution expressly deals with one kind of conflict. It applies to non-traditional conflicts, such as those over natural resources, to structural conflict, presumably, after all, you know, engaging women in decision-making, protecting their rights, uh, taking their views on board and reconstruction, all of this is part of any situation and complex emergencies. But then I have a piece, as a peace educator, I have two challenges. The first challenge is I have to redefine conflict to my audience, and then I have to drag 1325 over to show how it fits. I work in an area which ostensibly has no conflict. It's one thing for 1325, and if you look at states that were the first to adopt national action plans, many of them were, in, were, part, were undergoing transitions out of conflict that were in some measure managed or facilitated by the UN. So it makes sense to talk about 1325 and have a national action plan. But if you sit in South India, sometimes it makes no sense at all. So then, I, then I'm talking about, in, I'm, I broaden the frame and I wonder, now why didn't we put this effort into promoting CEDAW or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? You know, that the kind of energy we have put into talking about 1325, we have not put as far as I know into other instruments, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant of, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 
the core messages are the same, democracy, inclusion, rights, justice, and a state that delivers these and security to all sections of the population. But these are very wordy. And then 1325 has a pithy handle, I just say 1325, and I have four pillars, one, two, three, four, and I'm done. So is it that we live in an era dominated by marketing professionals, and so that which is the pithiest is the one that we work with? I actually want to know the answer to this. 1325 is also now a UN uh, member state agenda, funding comes from them. And as a peace educator working high, in a very hyper-local mode, really, well, where am I working? Is working on 1325 and working on peace about lobbying government, or is it about public education? Is there a meeting point between these worlds? You know, it feels like you're trapped in an endless game of twister to bridge these, the gulf between the conversation with government and the conversation with citizens. Because I think this is something that is part of the challenge of implementing 1325, that there is that gulf between government and citizen in almost every country now. Um, I think we all have to drop our pretenses on this. Uh, my second concern is as a feminist, it's, it's the journey of WPS resolutions that keeps circling, seem to be circling back to sexual violence and conflict. And the last, the April resolution had to do with, um, in a manner of speaking, with sexual and reproductive health rights. You know, the point is not, as Cora Weiss said, to make war safe for women, but that seems to be the low hanging fruit that the UN and member states are happy to reach for, and all of us possibly. The point is to prevent wars and to create peaceful societies. And we miss in this WPS discourse a marriage of missions between 1325 and UNESCO's building the defenses of the peace. As a gender equality activist in general, I'm more and more unsettled by how despite all the changes in our thinking that I earlier celebrated, we are returning to make women's existence about their bodies. In everyday news, in the WPS discourse, we must guard against essentializing women as their bodies that need protection from violence, that need special kinds of health care, and that must be supplied with special goods like sanitary napkins. The fact that most people explain the prevention pillar, and I love how Shamita describes this as the weakest P in the 1325 board. Um, the fact that most people explain prevention as preventing sexual and gender-based violence is an illustration. Women, like all other human beings, are much more than their physical selves and their physical needs. They have aspirations, they have hunger, they have creativity, they have political ambition, they have voices. Their health needs go beyond the reproductive system in their bodies. And we forget this because it is simpler to talk about women, to talk about ourselves as our bodies, our sexualized bodies, our maternal bodies. And in this, the WPS discourse begins to mirror the thinking of our societies. It is so much easier to draw attention to violence, whether domestic violence during COVID or street sexual harassment at other times, than to talk about exclusion from electoral politics for which we might be responsible, or the lack of um, access to credit, or the gendered impact of poor infrastructure on educational access. Violence against our bodies is a tangible thing. Even in the 20, 1325 context, protection of rights, gender mainstreaming, or consultation with women's movement um, groups seems much more abstract. So it's easier to say, well, you know, let's talk about naming and shaming for sexual violence. And so the agenda, once set by feminist peace activists, veers back, circles back, veers towards protection and protection alone, and we journey in into a slightly different looking, different sounding world that is still patriarchy. So while the WPS agenda seeks to protect women in war, we must protect the agenda from patriarchy. And I wanted to say something uh, about the question about the global south. This is actually already happening. Whether or not women know about 1325, they are in fact, um, they are in fact, participating 
in peace processes, in political processes. And the Afghan example is the most striking one right now as Afghan women have organized uh, by themselves, for themselves to get a seat at the peace table. So I'll leave it at that and thank you. Um, fantastic uh, things to reflect on, uh, which I'll try to build on in, in my thoughts here about the future of the agenda. Um, and, you know, I really loved the question about, or the way of thinking about WPS, about who is doing women, peace and security and also who it's being done to. And this again, reminds us of the really too easy binary global north, global south, and the way that that um, is perpetuated it, by states and by a lot of, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about how um, this has come up in some of the work I'm doing. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'll go back to saying that I think the, and this links to two of the questions we've had so far, that I think focusing on what we mean by a gender perspective, um, there's a lot of opportunity to really shift this in the future. And I think a necessity actually, because um, experts on women, peace and security uh, continue to predominantly be heterosexual global North speakers, right? And we can talk about how that manifests in publications around what's seen as women, peace and security work. You know, I'm based in an academic institution. So I'm certainly thinking about this when I'm putting together a syllabus, but um, in recent years, Outright Action International joined the NGO working group so that there was actually representation from an organization looking at LGBTQ issues in peace and conflict. And this is um, certainly new in terms of being official. I mean, you only have eight organizations that have ECOSOC uh, consultative status anyway. So um, it's very important to have this voice be part of the NGO and civil society work that is uh, promoting what women, peace and security will look like in the future. We can also look at uh, the gender subcommittee in Colombia and the work of organizations like Colombia Diversa, which um, you know, continue to publish on uh, the work they're doing. So this is um, accessible to other organizations, to other uh, certainly practitioners, if you're interested in what it means to take on a more expansive look at uh, a gender that does think about LGBTQ experiences, that does think about transphobic and homophobic violence, not, of course, not as other speakers have said, this participation component and protection component shouldn't just be about responding to violence, but it does also matter to understand why and when homophobic and transphobic violence is part of um, conflict. And in fact, we already know that if we were paying more attention to targeted violence against queer communities, we would have a different understanding of conflict, right? So queer organizations have been doing this work. So uh, in the future, a more expansive gender perspective could help us see that. But also when I'm thinking about protection, I'm thinking about peace building work that uh, going back to who is doing women, peace and security, I'm thinking about transformative justice strategies and also restorative justice strategies an abolitionist work, which um, in recent months, I would say over the past six months, the uh, events around thinking, uh, abolitionist thinking and uh, queer mutual aid projects, that's just kind of exploded on the international scene in a way that uh, is very welcome. So there's communities that have been working to draw attention to ways to provide security beyond policing, beyond um, and even we see this, of course, within women, peace and security, we see, uh, we see the essentialism and we see the slippery slope into, it's a is it feminist if we have more women in peacekeeping, if we have more women in police officers? And looking at the work, at some of this abolitionist work um, and books like Beyond Survival and The Revolution Starts at Home, these are transformative justice organizations that are led by people of color, queer people of color most often, and um, in a sense, I think that uh, peacekeeping work that isn't looking at the community-based initiatives for that sort of work are, are really, they got some catching up to do <laughs> because um, 
a lot of these organizations aren't looking to the state. So I think this also speaks to this gulf between civil society and the state. Queer organizations in a lot of spaces have never been able to rely on the, on the police, right? I, I had a conversation recently with someone who wrote an entire monologue about how when she in Northern Ireland experienced uh, homophobic violence, did not feel at all comfortable going to the police. And so this is just to say that we, we know that there have been other forms of community protection and security and ways of thinking about um, building peace. And so I, I just urge uh, a thinking about the future of women, peace and security that's also integrative of, of that. And also, I think that while it's important that we're moving towards the and have resolutions that talk about the, the need to pay attention to men and boys, there's a there can be sort of a siloing of women and girls, men and boys in a way that kind of misses how masculinity and femininity are operating in a way that isn't binary, actually. And so I think um, attention to gender based violence while there's been an increase in at looking at sexual violence against men, which is necessary to be looking at that, I still think there's room to be looking um, more intersectionally um, in a way that doesn't oppose these uh, as forms of violence, but actually understands, again, looking at how transphobic and homophobic violence um, and, and maybe uh, paying more attention to um, how masculinities and femininities are operating in, in different contexts, it, it can actually get at the root of what's going on with this violence in, in a way that is perhaps more productive. But I guess as a final thought here, um, I, I am, I do think it's kind of right. It is a bit curious. Why do we, why are there so many resolutions to do something that states actually are quite in many, and many, uh, they're, they're, there's no funding for this, right? Like it continues to be sidelined over and over again, but it's highlighted in certain spaces. And now we have what 11 resolutions. And I think part of that, we can also look to the way that LGBTQ human rights sometimes have been co-opted, right? So I think lessons on the way that homonationalism and pinkwashing operates are incredibly important to thinking about why it might be interesting to have the panel on women, peace and security while you continue to have uh, rampant misogyny and uh, horrific levels of sexual violence within the same institution that's interested in highlighting um, the really important women, peace and security agenda. So um, I just think that uh, it's it's important to, I mean, and it's, it's an ever present challenge. How, how do you highlight something that's that's so important in a feminist capacity when you also still just want to be able to be in the room at all. And that's again, something that queer organizations are constantly struggling with. And um, I have more thoughts about the way that localization has actually um, operated and um, especially thinking about global North and, and global South dynamics. Um, but I just wanted to end on one more thought because I saw that one of the questions was, um, you know, how as a white Western man in the room, can you um, be a WPs and security like ally, right? And I think again, well, first of all, everyone has a sexual orientation and gender identity. And I think that's important to remember. And also women, peace and security is about gender. It's not just about women. So I think it's always important for those who are in the position of privilege to see who's in the room and to advocate for those who are not and to do that again and again, because, and do that at the beginning of a process and not at the end, because it's very frustrating to be, you know, part of the organization that's uh, consulted towards the end of a peacekeeping mission because you can't actually mainstream gender or bring a queer perspective or an LGBTQ organization meaningfully into a project if it's, you know, a one day consultation towards the end of your project. So that I just, I'm, I'm sure other people will want to speak to that as well. Um, but I'll go ahead and leave it at that for now. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, there is not much left to see after all those brilliant uh, remarks by fellow panelists. And I was just telling Amanda that I'd much rather listen, but um, I will very quickly go back to my theme for today, uh, boring old politics at the Security Council, um, and discuss what the, this institutional context uh, might mean for the future. Um, so uh, 
first, uh, for the last few years, I find myself going back to an article uh, that Anne-Marie Gertz uh, wrote for Open Democracy after the election of Antonio Guterres as the ninth Secretary General. Uh, and one of the challenges that she identifies for him is that he'd have to work in a world that is re-nationalizing within courts um, and the challenge that this poses for multilateralism. And this, of course, has had an impact on the work of the Security Council. Uh, for instance, we've seen backtracking on issues like sexual and reproductive rights uh, in the 9th and 10th resolutions, reportedly at the behest of the United States. Um, the good news, though, is that we have these resolutions, and um, I keep changing my mind on this, but mostly I think we are fine with, with the resolutions that we have, and we perhaps don't need another one for some time. And um, that these are enough and in terms of international norms and mechanisms and that we um, uh, that, that the focus should really now be on implementation just in terms of you know accounting mechanisms as well that there, there are uh, accountability mechanisms there are a few uh, so really let's try and fund some of this work um, again which uh, which brings us to this aspect of uh, donor organization, uh, donor member states as well as um, other organizations. And the political economy of WPS is something that has been discussed. I mean, as far as the council is concerned, I mean, the council doesn't have money, right? It, it would have to come from the, the member states um, um, or for, for the general budget uh, or for the peacekeeping budget. Uh, the second point is uh, that um, again, something that has sort of been, uh, has, has come up and, uh, well, while on the one hand, the council is, is sort of central to international More often than not, suffering. Surprising that member states, as in some of the world, have been skeptical of the WPS agenda. And to add some of uh, Swarna's comments about engagement WPS, um, in India, I remember when I resumed uh, working in India. I, I was surprised by the fact that not just the government, but many civil society actors also maintained a sort of uh, distance from 1325 and preferred to rely, rely on CEDAW, uh, which is a binding, but also B does not have the tricky association with the Security Council. So uh, this is partly in response with, uh, to the question on uh, WPS and the Global South that we, we need to recognize, and again, something that's been mentioned before, that important feminist work on peace and security work that does not use WPS vocabulary is very vital and it needs to be recognized as such. And this particular point, I want to wrap up by uh, recalling what Felicity Hill and Edith Ballantyne of WILF had said in 2007, quite early on, and you know, before there was a second resolution really, that uh, so they said this in context of wills that more effort needs to be put into wills using 1325 rather than 1325 using wills, uh, and so that is something uh, I think we all need to take account of in our work, including in academia. To what extent do we let uh, WPS uh, kind of drive our uh, research and 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 practice? And finally, while my own work has focused mainly on uh, um, uh, armed conflicts, I'm very interested in, in the advocacy and scholarship that uh, is seeking to link WPS to non-traditional issues such as uh, climate change related migration and human trafficking that, that came in, up in our book on your directions. And even to um, uh, traditional security issues where WPS for one reason or the other had not featured substantively. So we now see references to gender-based violence uh, in the UN Arms Trade Treaty, which is really something that needs to be 
celebrated or the, the recent research that looks into the relevance um, of WPS for uh, as far as privatization of war is concerned and the role uh, increase companies. So this is a rather uh, the uh, rather generic comment, but I, I would like to think that it, it would hold us, it suddenly holds me in good stead to recall that when we talk about WPS, the issues that need to be considered in WPS, that we need to locate those conversations in this, you know, in the continuum of violence, a, a feminist concept that was referred to earlier. And that when we are thinking about responses uh, to these issues, that we locate WPS in a, not only in its own policy architecture, but the complex uh, policy architecture around gender equality that includes, you know, starting from UDHR to CEDAW, especially general recommendation number 30, the Beijing uh, platform for action and the critical areas of, of concern, and more recently, uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, thank you, that's, that's, that's me. I hope, excuse me, I've just lost my video and my microphone, but I think everyone can hear me now. Thank you so much for a roller coaster of ideas. This has been such an exciting event for now, so, so far. And I'm sure the, we will use the last 20 minutes um, with great benefit to everyone as well. I have been trying to make notes and thinking about how I could sort of summarize the themes that we've just been um, hearing about and where we might find some sort of focus and structure. I think the, the, the one focal theme is probably the, the teasing out that every speaker has just done of the inherent contradiction between the radical potential and, and, and philosophy of, of what lies behind WPS. And I specifically say lies behind because it's got this over a century worth of women's activism that, that lies behind it and the implementation or the dependence to some degree um, of its implementation on some form of state support, advocacy, maybe even resources, and that contradicting um, with state interests. So we might develop this in, in, in further um, contributions to and answers to the questions. I will probably start going, coming from the, the most recent questions and then go Oh, no, I will, no, I will start, actually, I will start with Molly Bratt's question, which is directed at Cynthia, and then we gradually, I've, we've worked out some form of order for, for the, for, for the um, question and answer session. So I'll start with Molly Bratt, um, who asked, um, who was 17, and so it's a, a crucial question for her that she poses. Um, to Cynthia Petri. I, I have done, or to Cynthia, I have done a bit of research into your NGO Beyond Peace, this was inspiring. I would love to do something along the lines of women's NGOs with my future. Please, can you tell me how, how you got into this? Is there anything you can recommend I should study, engage in? Best wishes. So over to Cynthia, who can then also move on to Ed Fraser's question. As a white Western European man deploying on peacekeeping operations, often in countries that don't have their own UNSCR 1325 National Action Plan, what advice do you have for me if I am to be an effective WPS ally? I know that several panelists um, have already indicated that they would very much like to engage with that question. So Cynthia, would you like to take over from me? Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, uh, Molly, for the question. Uh, how I got there, I was angry. You have to be angry to get in this field of studies. And one would hope, you know, I'm in my early 50s, one would hope that in your generation you don't need, but I think you still need to get angry at what you see around you. In the beginning, I was not at all in 
gender studies and this line of work. I worked in humanitarian work. I work in conflict resolution. And I realized I was the only woman sitting um, in the in the negotiating room at the peace table for the peace process in Mindanao. It has developed a lot later. Huh? The, the, even the the chair of the government panel was was a woman and so on. But when when I started there in 2009, I was the only uh, woman in the room. Um, and uh, the, gov the government of Philippines didn't have a women negotiator. The Moro Islamic Liberation Front, needless to say, didn't have a female negotiator, uh, the facilitator as well, etc. And uh, we were the international contact group, and by kind of coincidence, all the other members, they were uh, ambassadors or heads of NGOs, they were male. Uh, I also worked monitoring ceasefires. I was the only woman there. I, you know, I worked in military camps, training military in behaving better. I was the only women in the teaching uh, and uh, officers uh, 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 level and, and so on. And I heard and saw a lot of very annoying things. And so slowly, slowly, I started specializing in, in this field, so it's anger. And the second reason is I saw that when you give a job to women, when you work with women, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. Every time I've worked with women, uh, it, it was very rewarding because they were 100% at what they were doing. They were able to build alliances. They had creative ideas. They were effective. So you need to, to, you are young and you need to get more angry and we would love you to join us because we need uh, women and men from all generations and all walks of life to work on this. I'm sure my uh, uh, colleagues, the, the fellow panelists will have a lot to say. So I will, I will keep it short for that one. And I think, you know, we will hear uh, uh, other stories now now coming to ed's question uh thank you ed thank you i worked with a lot of uh, military i think the first thing you need to do is to ask women in the country where you work because there is no one size fits all there is no one answer and there is no one woman who can tell you you know how to work with other women elsewhere i think in every context you have a different situation and you have very re uh, resourceful uh, women who will find the best way to work uh, as i showed earlier these cameroonian women are painting on their body to ask for a ceasefire in another country it will be something completely different so women who take risks who are in the field uh, know what works in their context and what they need is support so ask them and sometimes my experience is that in military camps it's quite a, a, a closed environment obviously be, for, for be, because of security reasons because of the, the the overwork because of all all the good reasons that we know often military don't have access to a broader range of information as we do in the civilian uh, uh, work so what i would advise is whatever country you you are working with to take the time to connect with you um you are you are british i think uh uh if you're british with like the 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 uh the the uh, defeat uh, uh advisor the conflict advisor at the embassy or the high commission to connect with is there a un mission with the gender the focal point uh is there a a local uh, umbrella organization for uh, women so reach out to to them they will be surprised but they will help you so go and speak to them and ask them how can we help you and uh, and and i think that's that's the first step and from there you will you will embark on this beautiful journey and we will be there for you you can also i think what's important in this field of work because we are often very lonely in what we are doing is to build uh, alliances and support. So uh, Andrea, who, who is one of the facilitators of this, uh, of, of this conversation, knows that uh, she, she even uh, suggested when, when I went to, to CAR, 
before I went to CAR to work in a, in a military mission, she said, you will need support. So we created a support group. So when I was there, and, and it was very lonely for a civilian women to be in that uh, military context, I was contacting them. I need help with this. Uh, I'm fed up with that. So building alliances, asking for someone's advice. So Ed, when you are out there, consider us as your advisory group and we can, you know, help you with ideas. But the first group you need to speak to is the women in the country where you are working. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cynthia. I think Ed's question inspired a lot of us to um, to reflect on. I wanted to pick up on it, um, also because I think there's elements in it that are useful for all of us to remember, right? Um, because so Ed asks, as a as a white white man in the British military, how can you do double UPS? And I think the first part of that is something that is already being done in the phrasing of that question, um, which is to interrogate what position we're coming at this from, right? Like how does, and, and to bear that in mind with the work that we do, you know, whatever our sexual orientation or, or you know, how we're racialized or so on presents is, is for all of us to think about, you know, how, how is my particular positionality affecting how I'm doing this work, what problems I'm seeing, what kinds of solutions I come up with. Um, and I think that's a useful reminder for all of us to keep in line. And, and on the second part of what, what actually practically to do, I completely endorse what Cynthia was saying about consultation. Um, so not letting us fall into to the assumption that we already know who conflict affected women are and what they need and want, right? Is to figure out ways of consulting, of studying what is happening um, and, and with the important recognition that you know, conflict affected women are a diverse group and, and how factored and their experiences are mediated by factors, including gender, but also including race or ethnicity or sexual orientation and so forth. So to, to allow for the answer to be that there isn't one priority that all conflict affected women necessarily, necessarily share. Um, and I also wanted to point out because at the end of the last session, we had this question about um, what does resolution 1325 do in contexts where domestic laws on, on sexual violence, for example, are, are insufficient or absent. And actually we have an answer to that question also in the questions box. So Graziella Pika is, is kind of picking up on the, on the linkages between the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and WPS, um, so human rights frameworks in that work in UN Women already in 2012, Graziella says we're doing extensive work on the complementarity of these two, two agendas. Um, CEDA is general recommendation number 30, addresses violence against women, and CEDA, which is you know the most widely ratified UN human rights treaty, has obligations in a first state parties to remedy um, these kind of shortcomings in domestic legal frameworks. So to work with, with kind of a broader array, array of, of questions, what 1325 or the WPS agenda, what's, what's in it um, on that question is, is the question of security sector reform, right? Post-conflict building up of, of security and justice institutions, which may open up spaces to address some of these, some of these legal gaps. And I'll leave it there and pass it on to I'm not sure is Andrea next. Um, ah, here we are. Thank you so much. We now have six minutes left and loads of really, really excellent and important and wide ranging questions. So I will try to bunch a few together so we can at least have some further discussion points, but I would like at the end to address the question, how did we all get into, um, or how did all the panelists get into the women's peace and security field? So one of the questions we have, how do we make the feminist WPS agenda more accessible to women in the global South, where the emphasis is, emphasis is more on representation rather than agency and emancipation, and unfortunately both are not working. I specifically refer to this question because we said we would talk about this um, in the second part, and I don't want to miss this. Um, we have a similar sort of 
range of questions to what extent from Tracy McSephanie to what extent is the WPS agenda simply about good leadership and education um, and then another one is the WPS agenda or some of its pillars experiencing a backlash especially from some members of the Security Council what can activists do to address it now I will hand over to um, who would like to go first? Sumita, would you like to start off on this? I know I'm dropping you in it a little bit there. Um, to start off with the question, maybe is there a backlash against mem from members of the Security Council? Um, I'm uh, on that question, uh, I'm mostly familiar with uh, the politics relating to sexual and reproductive rights uh, uh, on health. And as I mentioned, yes, uh, it's 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 been uh, contested, and the 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 specific phrases which were included in previous resolutions are not included in in the more recent ones. So clearly, that is a sign of backlash uh, against this. And in fact, there has been quite a bit of worry about um, backtracking on other aspects uh, of the agenda as well, which um, I've heard being mentioned at different forums. Um, shall I briefly, uh, perhaps I could also briefly refer to the, uh, the question about um, the how to make WPS agenda more relevant for the Global South. Um, I, if, if you could come back to me, please, because I want to pull out the specific question so as not to get it wrong. So if we could move on to another speaker, please. Thank you. I'm not entirely sure. Ah, here we go. Um, Swana, would you like to address the Global South question or um, is someone else keen to jump in? If not, then... I did actually in my... Um... Yeah, you did talk about that in your, in your presentation, in which case, can we use the last three minutes, please, to reflect on Flora Vickers' question. She's a King's College London graduate. She's asked, she's, um, her, quest, her point is, hello, hello all, thank you for this interesting roundtable discussion, very interesting. Can you discuss how you found the field of WPS and how you have arrived at your job today? Now, some of you have already spoken to this, um, but Swana, would you like to take over? Me? I, I think the short answer, given that we're short on time, is I do this because I am. I am a woman and I want to live in a peaceful world. And it's a very simple thing. Um, there are longer stories that I could tell, but we'll do that another day. Thank you very much, Swana. We have been considering whether this is actually a question that needs to be addressed in a, in a wider forum. So you've given us a job to do, Flora. Um, we will consider maybe putting on a different event. We'll, we'll see how we, can, how we can make this something because we all agree it's an excellent question. It's a very important question, particularly today. Um, because because we have all these concerns about where the women peace and security agenda might be going considering the wider geopolitical developments so what i would like to um, to do to close off is to perhaps start again with saskia because it's been a long time since we've had the opportunity to hear from her um, for a, a, a final set of reflections not more than about 10, 15 seconds, um, each of you, and we'll just use the same, the same um, speaking order as we had in the second round. Saskia, are you on standby? I am. Brilliant, over to you. And then if, if we do the same thing as we did in the two um, panel sessions. 
Uh, well, um, that's again a very difficult task. I, I really just want to make one, yeah, two really brief points. Uh, and one is again from a European perspective, I think what we haven't talked about at all is a, a rising trend towards neo-authoritarian rule in Europe, um, semi-democratic uh, systems being set up, fake democracies and so on and so forth. So I think of uh, seeing that the women's rights are under scrutiny in, in a lot of contexts and um, that WPS will be facing new and probably unexpected challenges in a lot of the um, established democracies in the world. Uh, that's a more a larger point and a smaller, more practical point. I think uh, this question about do we need new resolutions and how effective are they and should we have that? What I'm hearing from, from national actors, all they say is please no more resolutions uh, because I don't think we realize how much many countries are behind, terribly behind in just um, implementing and, and setting up national action plans on the, you know, the earlier resolutions. So um, I'm not saying we shouldn't have more, I think we should have more, but I think we have to consider uh, the enormous stresses we're putting on um, national institutions and actors that are already fighting very hard to make even the most basic points relevant in their own national context. And that's it for me, thank you so much. Are we going in the same order? Um, one of the things that I always find hopeful and generative about WPS is the amount of community it has created around it, whether we're talking about activist communities, scholarly communities, practitioner communities, not that those are always nearly separable, we kind of shift in and out of roles. And, and what I learn, I'm very excited at the moment, we're just starting a new academic year and welcoming a new cohort of, of gender, peace and security students. So this is a community that's growing constantly. And one of the things that I have learned from, from speaking with people who, who work in this field is how, how what sustains this community is not necessarily the institutional trappings or the resolutions, but rather the ability to build feminist networks across that and, and sometimes in, in contradictions what's happening in the, in the institutions of power of how that's a source of, of sustenance. So I would like to thank all of you for being part of that community and, and enabling us to learn from each other's work and, and hopefully that's something we can keep going as a, as a source of sustenance. I want to answer Flora's question as a conclusion. I said earlier that I got in this field because I was angry and I decided to use this anger not in a violent way but in a constructive way and I think it's this, this kind of constructive and loving energy that is a feminine energy and we need more of that today and uh, I want to thank uh, Amanda and Andrea and all the panelists and all the audience and I think this is a start of a new very beautiful network and I look forward to seeing you again online or in person or in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's easy and particularly with those of us that have trained as academics, it's easy to pick holes in the resolutions, in the discourse, in the institutions, in our governments. But um, uh, this is where you, you sort of default to the peace educator uh, location and say, well, how much do I own this agenda? How important is it to me? And where do I find the spaces and the platforms and the opportunities in my everyday life to bring a little bit of, this, of these values into the world? Um, so that is the question I would like to leave everyone with. How much do you own the WPS agenda?
Yeah, I think that's such a fantastic point. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick here. So I would say in addition to anger, which is right on, um, it's also curiosity that brings me to the work I do. And I'm going to point to Cynthia Enlow and, and you know, the question of wow, where are the women when we think about peace and security. But of course, I'm just kind of sifting through all the work and I'm like, where are the LGBTQ people, right? <laughs> like, and knowing they're there, like we know those of us who are doing activism, we know they're in the room, we know they're doing this work. So what's going on that it's not necessarily showing up in some of the spaces that you would expect it to, right? And I mean, the short answer is patriarchy, but that, you know, my commitment in women, peace and security work is to, you know, shift that and to constantly be asking where the queer queers in these spaces. Um, Agree, no more resolutions. And I also think to the earlier question, um, our resolutions can already do the work of supporting queer and trans communities. So what does it mean to look at, to make the resolutions do the work that we as feminists know that they can do? And I guess the final point is indeed ask for help and also understand that, um, yeah, once you ask for help there, there, you know, you, you reach out for help and understand that, especially those, those in a position of privilege, you know, you don't have to be part of the queer community to advocate and, and lift up those folks. So, um, yeah, I just think I thank you so much for this this round table and let's definitely continue these conversations. Uh, thank you again, Andrea and Amanda and all my fellow panelists. I really enjoyed the session today. Um, in the 10, 15 seconds um, loosely understood, I will quickly <laughs> um, just three points. One, uh, uh, addressing the question from Sarah Valentine on on the U.S. Uh, sexual assault um, in the U.S. and sexual assault against women in the U.S. military, the question was: If they can't get their own house in order, how can they expect other nations to do it? And so, a couple of things. Um, on the one hand, we know that there's a lot of hypocrisy that goes on in in the kind of work that's done. But the all, another thing to remember is that the WPS agenda is not a uh, a US resolution. It is a resolution that has been put together by member states of the UN and countries from the global south and global north, especially women peace activists had a lot to do with it. So we need to own that and then make member states and other actors um, uh, make sure that they implement it and they make the necessary changes. Um, Second, uh, the, the question on how to make feminist WPS agenda more accessible to women in global south. Um, I don't think we need to make the agenda necessarily accessible. There are a lot of groups that are already doing the important work that needs to be done. So it's a question of providing support to those groups and bringing in international norms where necessary. And to further recognize that WPS is actually not as expansive um, as has already been discussed, there are other international policy instruments that can play a very important role. And finally, regarding my own interests, so um, I take note of uh, anger and curiosity and then say that my own work was a, a, a very naive interest in how does change happen and you know the fact that the security council adopted a resolution well how did that happen and how can we learn from that to bring about other kinds of progressive transformations so that's what got me interested in the wps agenda thank you and thank you everyone again now thank you very much to all our panelists who have really excelled themselves um, at presenting us with a feast of thoughts and ideas and reflections which we i think all of us will continue to have to digest for the foreseeable future if this hasn't enthused people to engage with the women peace and security agenda and really put their thinking caps on and start developing ideas of how we might be able to do better then I don't know what can so thank you very very much to all our panelists we've done you've done an amazing job here I shall not try to sum up anything because it's impossible um, but instead hand over to Amanda so that she can put um, the final um, concluding remarks on this rather amazing session. Thank you to all and of course to our audience and their engagement with um, the speaker's contributions. Uh, thank you Andrea for passing the job to sum up to me. Uh, <laughs> I too can't really sum this up other than this is just 
again, the continuing of the conversation um, and collaboration and feminist solidarity networks that, you know, um, Aiko particularly spoke to too and um, um, Sumita um, writes about. And we all, you know, had this such a vibrant conversation. I just quickly, five seconds, this, if for me, this feels fantastic again to be engaged in such vibrant, intellectually stimulating discussion that I feel so nourished. And I want to keep this conversation going, but unfortunately, we went way over our two hour slot. But um, again, I think, a panelist, you rock, you're awesome, clapping hands to all of us. And audience for asking such fab questions. Um, this, these are really important questions. And just watch this space. There's more collaboration coming. And I hope we're all leave this space energized for lunch or, or a drink, cup of tea, or otherwise, depending on where in the world we are tuning in. So again, thank you so much um, for participating and coming along. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.